Welcome once again to episode 41 Space for Women show. Today's show is dedicated to the road to gender parity through astronaut training with very, very special guests um, and collaborators. Uh, um, today we will be talking about anticipating trends for inclusing inclusive human spaceflight with analog mission studies. And uh, we'll also have um, the way forward requires both policy action and the nurturing of family, having um, an analog astronaut uh, from the Austrian Space Forum presenting her uh, personal story through motherhood and uh, um, how she conquered the, the STEM field. And uh, we'll be also learning about the women's empowerment program. So let me welcome you all once again. Um, let me introduce you briefly to our esteemed guest, um, Claudia Kessler. She's the CEO founder and founder at Astronaut, um, at Astronaut in Germany, based in Germany, this company. And uh, Mr. Lesik tuning in from Poland today. Um, Lesik Osechowski, he's an architect and a founder of Space Is More. And uh, Annika Millis. Uh, we have two analog astronauts at Austrian Space Forum today. Um, Dr. Simon Paternostro, he's also an analog astronaut at, at Austrian Space Forum. He is uh, a SSP 19 alumni at the International Space University and he holds many masters, but today he's going to be uh, moderating the show with us today. So. I'm turning over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Ian, and welcome everyone. Welcome in particular to our panelists. Uh, it's a, at least here it's a sunny day in the Netherlands. I hope everything is well also from your side. So I will uh, start from the first, uh, our the first presentation from the first uh, panelist, Lesek. Uh, as Ian presented, he's an architect and founder of the Spaces More. Uh, and is also the uh, the manager of the Lunaris Research Station, an analog habitat designed to study human health and psychology during simulated planetary mission. So, let's take, please. Hello. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for having me here. Probably. Okay, so it's all about anticipating trends for inclusive human spaceflight with analog mission studies. It is a subjective take on the past uh, missions and crews and in, uh, in regard to gender parity in Lunaris Research Station. And I will show you what Lunaris is. Um, Lunaris is an analog habitat. Uh, it's located in post-Soviet era um, military airfield with those great uh, bunkers that hosted uh, Sukhoi 22nd that was supposed to bomb uh, Copenhagen in case of World War III with nuclear devices. Now we are using it to test people inside in regard to human spaceflight. Uh, inside, inside the analog habitat, we are closing people for uh, some, amount of, um, some amount of time, like two weeks. They are living there, working there, uh, doing studies. The, studying, the study is also done on them by psychologists, by doctors, and they are doing EVAs inside this huge hangar. This is how Lunar's uh, layout look like, um, historical hangar. Uh, this is our EVA area or extravehicular activity area where all the spacewalks are uh, done and they and it's all connected through an airlock to our research station or analog habitat um, that hosts many many uh, modules seven of them so maybe not that many but those modules have designated uh, tasks and features like there is an electric electronic workshop mechanical workshop gym an office, a small capsule hotel uh, for a crew to sleep in, a kitchen, a small bio lab, and a hygiene module where we test uh, gray water, uh, mm, how we can use gray water to, to help with our missions. Uh, since its founding in 2017, we've done 11 analog missions. One is currently underway. Uh, and there were, there were already 65 people from 12 different countries isolated inside our facility. There are six female commanders, so um, more than half of all the missions, uh, in fact, uh, had uh, this uh, uh, female commander. So I made a slight mistake here. 
And there are 40% of female participants during those missions, uh, 33 publications were published already. And in 2017, we had a first analog para astronaut study in the world. Uh, we received, there are some documentaries that were either film or are being filmed. And we are and we received honorary patronage of Polish Space Agency as well as Polish Ministry of Health for current studies related to COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. And now we have growing community of uh, international partners and researchers. Probably we'll get to that a bit later. I would like to focus on our female commanders. Uh, several. I will take. I will give you several stories. Uh, in three of them. Uh, so I will start very quickly with uh, the middle one, Sarah Jane Pell, a very uh, well uh, and re like renowned analog astronaut and a scientist and uh, and uh, an artist that was a uh, mission commander during um, their uh, during Spectra mission in 2018. And having a commander that is uh, that can inspire people is extremely important. This is something that we learn from this mission that having the right person and that that creates the mission that creates that selects the crew and tries to um come up with some very interesting science science that you can uh, check on this and under this link uh can inspire their crew members that didn't have opportunity before to join uh, an analog mission uh, for example, um, during this mission, uh, one of the mission like crew members were, it was uh, JJ Hastings, and she created, after uh, participating in our Lunaris uh, isolation mission, a uh, sensoria program uh, that last year had uh, hosted in high seas a uh, full female uh, analog crew. Their motto is spaces for everyone. And this is a very nice indication that and we need a role model, like a strong female role models to inspire people to achieve more. Now we know that JJ Hastings will be coming back to us next month as a commander, uh, but she was shy of having this first analog full, uh, full female crew uh, since uh, two months or three months earlier, Samantha Cristoferetti had her uh, Nemo mission uh, in, in Aquarius. And this is when I can come to my second um, commander, Dorota Budzin, my very good friend from the very beginning of our education. Uh, when she was part of um, uh, ESA Young Graduate Training uh, Program, she was supporting this mission. So she was not a part of the crew, but she was a supporting member. Uh, since the mission was testing her, Prototypes. She was developing prototypes for ESA of future uh, tools for geological testing on the moon, and this is, it was the main study. But this is uh, this is like a very big achievement. And many years before, uh, when I met Dorota back in 2013, we were like very young, and we just and I approached her as a young architect to help me with uh, my uh, space project, and we started working right away. And this is. Uh, why that happened even, because uh, in our country, in Poland, there is a strong government uh, incentive for young women to study STEAM majors. Uh, there is this ongoing program that is, that is I guess, it's, it has already 10 years, and each year, um, either, either government or local, uh, or local um, government is giving scholarships to young women to apply for uh, STEM majors. That's made us well a little bit above average of the world when it comes to uh, women in STEM majors. Uh, while we still have like this 55 percent, 57 percent of women in universities, just like is in the rest of the world. In Poland, we have 36 percent of women in STEM fields. It's a very nice incentive for young women to start uh, their uh, their uh, academia experience. And this is how I could met Dorota because she used the scholarship to. Uh, uh, you know, on our university, uh, what? But and that had an uh, uh, interesting impact on our city as well, city of Wrocław or Breslau, because uh, we we are uh, uh, I I guess we are now um, we have also some people from Germany or or, or Austria. Um, now, just like a week ago, was uh, featured in Global Cities of the Future um, ranking, and decide like 
cities like Singapore or London, we were at 15th uh, place. But when it comes to mid-sized and small cities, we are in fact located at the very first uh, um, rank. So, and it is connected to this incentive of educating young women because I really I know very well that in Wrocław we have a lot of companies, tech companies, uh, created and led by women. Uh, go back to Dorota very quickly. Back in 2017, she led an uh, uh, analog mission, one of the, our first analog missions um, in Lunares, uh, along with our friend Joanna from our third, our very same uh, university. Uh, they became a very good team uh, while doing this study. After that, or maybe at the same time, uh, Dorota started her own uh, research group and applied and successfully applied for uh, ESA REXUS program, where they had to design a scientific experiment that will go on the rocket. One of those blue modules is theirs. They were studying uh, space mining, if you, uh, if you would like to know. And this is a very nice story here, since um, the crew was, well, team was approaching different uh, different uh, mining companies, like and this is something big in, in Poland. So, and there are like established companies with all CEOs that uh, may be a little bit gender biased. And when they approached them, uh, the, the CEO was always referring to uh, a male crew members. It was baffling and confusing to him at first to uh, acknowledge that Dorota is leading the project. But after he understood that he really switched and adapted very well. Like sometimes a bias isn't ill uh, motivated. Uh, sometimes some, uh, someone is, was not in the right environment to experience a strong female um, leaders before. And this is when we understood that uh, along this incentive for young women to study, we need a very strong um, heroes or leaders or, or, or someone that you can uh, look up to. That's why we, uh, together with Joanna, with Dorota, and with uh, Dr. Anna Fogman, all of them studied in Wrocław in our city. We created uh, European space stock. Um, all of those people are, uh, were already associated with ESA, either by doing their fellowship or uh, YGT. And this event really was a major success with 200, maybe even more people attending, men and women. Uh, at a young age, and this was very inspirational. Also, to see older generation of Poles uh, coming, and was and that was, and they are super interested in seeing what is now available for uh, younger generations. Something that wasn't uh, back in their uh, youth. Um, so this is when we knew that uh, we should think about having an incentive for young women with scholarship at the very beginning of their education, but also feature this uh, role models. And now, and when it comes to uh, European astronauts, we have Samantha. And with this new, uh, with this new call for the astronauts, media, purposely or not, already associated her also with those hopes, not only for women but also for disabled people. Uh, so now she has a very difficult uh, task uh, to represent very different um, communities here, and. That this is great that the next uh, call will increase the number of uh, female astronauts and will give a lot more role models to follow. But um, I have still some time because I have the last story. Oh, I am, I am, I am almost done. Great. Um, since our last commander that I would like to feature is Christiane Henike, a very well established analog astronaut researcher. And she was very prominent uh, persona in high seas four mission, the year long isolation in, uh, in Hawaii. That's why our flight surgeon, uh, Alexander Baśniowski, Dr. Alexander Baśniowski, uh, approached her to help us or help him with his uh, uh, study. We needed a very grounded, very experienced commander to handle the very first disabled person in, uh, during analog mission, a study what would happen on Mars, for example, if there would be some kind of accident. Uh, our um, analog astronaut was had lo uh, experienced loss of eyesight. Uh, he lost his left uh, hand and three fingers in his right hand, but he adapted very well. And it, it was all thanks to a very experienced commander that was able to handle a difficult situation of adapting and disabled 
uh, analog astronaut mm, in this scenario. Uh, I will skip that. The, this research was very well received, for example, at, during World Extreme Medicine Expo, it was featured two times um, in each passing year. That, and this is why NASA uh, was really also very interested in this study and replicated it a year after. So maybe, just maybe, we also had this small contribution to this new para-astronaut uh, call with our uh, analog, uh, analog studies. We are not stopping there, or Dr. Bashniowski is not stopping there. And together with uh, divers from uh, City of Tiwa, where Habitat is located, they are they having a program to teach people with disabilities to scuba dive. And this is also related to, uh, obviously, human spaceflight. And those ripples on the pool, I would like to imagine that those are the ripples of analog missions that uh, focus on gender equality and parity, as well as uh, inclusion and um, of uh, people with disabilities. And this is, this is all, I guess. So the next one would be Hanika Melis. Uh, she studied biology with focus on microbiology and as well as engineering for environmental technology. She worked as a team leader in the infection protection environmental medicine in the health department uh, of Plauen. And she's uh, completing her PhD in public health. Uh, she is also she is also involved in other activities like Code for Space and Talent for Space as a trainer, and she's an anorgan astronaut for the Austrian Space Forum uh, since 2019, and she will join the next uh, incoming uh, mission ABD20 that is going to take place in Israel later this year. And last but not least, she's a mother of three wonderful daughters. And, uh, <laughs> the floor is yours for the presentation, Annika. And she's going to give us a little bit of insight of her experiences. So um, yeah, hello everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, thank you, Simone, for the um, nice introduction. And um, today's topic is very close to my heart, and I'd like to use my next 10 minutes to tell you why. Um, here you can see a picture of the class of 2019 of uh, the analog astronauts of the Austrian Space Forum. You might recognize our um, host or our moderator in the back. Um, and as you can see, I am the only woman in the group. Um, and uh, when we were introduced to the public in 2019, a big German newspaper titled Mama of Mars Mission, which translates to Mom on Mars Mission. Um, and never mind that I am a microbiologist and engineer and public health expert, but obviously having three children and being the only woman was um, more of a clickbait than all the rest. Um, and even though being a woman hasn't played a big role in my career, in my opinion, um, it seems to be a big thing to a lot of people looking in from the outside. And um, one or two of the questions that I got asked in every interview that I did um, from, those, from that time on um, was, what is your family saying to you being away on missions? Um, and who's taking care of your kids when you are gone? Um, but before I answer those questions, um, I want to say that in the beginning, I was kind of annoyed or even amused about those questions. But um, I started to realize that um, I'm in a position to show other women that it's possible to have kids and a career in STEM or otherwise. And now I kind of like the... Um, yeah, the visibility that I have to use it to help others along and to, yeah, uh, connect people and um, show that there are a lot of great role models that girls and women can use um, as a yeah template, for example, for their own life. Um, and here, there's a small um, survey, just a random one that I picked off the internet, um, and you can see that um, a lot of boys. Um, said that they wanted to be an astronaut, or some that did, but anyway, um, I, that's me on the right side, um, when I broke my arm at age six, going down a hill ice skating. <laughs> anyway, I didn't know what I wanted to be at that age. And I sometimes say that I still don't really know what I want to be when I grow up, but um, I had great role models when I was a kid. My mom was an engineer, um, as well as my, my dad as well. Um, and I had a lot of women around me that went to work and had kids and I never questioned my right to 
kind of have it all um, because that was the typical life that women had in the GDR where I grew up. Um, but I realized quite early in my career that that was a lucky circumstance and that a lot of women and girls all over the world are not that lucky. Um, and that's why um, role models are a big topic um, that I talk about a lot and that I try to um, yeah, make visible to others. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about our selection process because that might be one of the first parts after getting the idea to apply why there are not more women in um, positions like this. Um, one third of the applicants for the class of 2019 um, for analog astronauts at the Austrian Sp Space Forum were women, but only one, me, was selected in the end out of eight people. Um, and of course, I myself and the others asked why that is or why is that? Um, the selection was focused on so many different topics that um, I wouldn't say that women were in any way hampered to make it. Um, there were a lot of tests about um, physical fat, fitness, mental fitness, patience, um, stress resistance, and of course, a lot of psychological things like team um, and leadership skills, um, communication, stuff like that. Um, and the only thing that made a difference in the end, I think, is that the spacesuit simulator that we work with is really, really heavy. It weighs up to 50 kilos. And you can imagine that if there's a small woman uh, weighing maybe 50 kilos herself, that she will have difficulties working for several hours in that spacesuit. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why there were not more women selected. Um, but in the end, um, it is as it is right now. Um, and as Simone introduced or told in my introduction, um, I also have three kids, um, three daughters who are seven, 10 and 13 years old right now. Um, and I think that they played um, a big role in my selection because as you can read here, it takes a village to raise a child. And besides the village, it also takes a lot of nerve and um, yeah, a lot of um, organizational skills and you have to be pretty stress resistant um, to manage everything. And doing my studies and working and having the kids and everything kind of prepared me to um, have a lot of the soft skills that um, I think made a difference in the end that got me selected. So um, I would say that I didn't get selected because uh, um, I didn't get selected even though I have a family, but I got selected because I have a family. At least that's my the thing that I choose to take away from it. <laughs> yeah, and um, then there's uh, some impressions from our training. We had um, five months of um, basic training in 2019. And there were so many things that we got to do. Um, we had great fun, Simone can second to that, I guess. Um, learning to set up a Wi-Fi, um, doing communication tests, um, we did first aid and wilderness survival training. We had to hone our fine motoric skills. Um, and you can see um, one of our teammates from Israel and me in the suits um, on the left side. Um, and you can see that uh, the suit fits both of us. Um, they are the same size. Um, so it's kind of um, adaptable to a certain degree. Um, Maybe you remember that a few uh, months ago there, or even years in the, uh, right now, um, there was supposed to be an all-female spacewalk on the ISS, which uh, didn't work out in the, fir the first try because they didn't have uh, two suits that fit uh, both women. Um, so that's uh, not the problem with our suit, but still um, you have to have certain measurements to fit in there. And um, that might be another thing that in the future um, will have to be looked at that it's not uh, the hardware hindering women or women from participating. Anyway, then we did um, firefight and safety training, um, quad bike training, which was great fun, I can tell you, um, and also geology field training. Um, and to sum it up, I want to say that nothing in this training um, 
wasn't doable by a woman. So um, I wouldn't see any reason why there couldn't be more women joining and um, taking part in this kind of endeavor. Um, and for me personally, being selected and then um, being able to do everything that was thrown my way um, really built my confidence um, outside of the analog astronaut thing. Because um, right now, if somebody else gives me a task, then I kind of assume that they think that I can do it by my resume, or whatever. And if I believe that they are right and I just try and do it, most of the time it's working out. And that's something that I really try to tell others, uh, my kids and everybody else as well, that of course it's not um, right to say that you can do everything because maybe you won't be able to do everything. But um, I think that it's always a good thing to start and to at least try. And then you get farther than you probably think about yourself in the beginning. Yeah, and um, to sum it up, um, here are some of the um, other projects that I'm involved in and uh, that focus on showcasing role models or um, connecting and making visible women in STEM or other um, science fields. Um, if you want, you can take a look at those. Um, and I want to say that, in my opinion, every woman is a superwoman. And um, you shouldn't compare yourself to others. You should find out what's best for you and what um, career path fits you, and then support others in their choices as well. And if you, you yourself have an idea, then you should spread it. And if you know about something, then you should teach it to others. Um, and I also think it's an important tip to find a mentor early on in your career because um, that's always um, easier to open doors for you and to connect to other people than doing it all by yourself. And then the next step, mentor others, because um, if there's somebody else who has a question or you, who needs your help, then you do good by um, just giving back what you got from somebody else. Um, yeah. and. Um, then in the end, um, I think that connecting and networking is very important. Nobody's here by themselves. And um, in the end, uh, the space sector is one of the places that I enjoy most. Um, the, the, yeah, the working in, in teams with um, international and interdisciplinary people where you yeah, get to hear about different ways of life, different careers and uh, ideas, and everybody works together for a common goal. Um, that's really in inspiring. And um, you can translate that to other fields of life as well. Yeah, and um, I want to close by answering those questions from the beginning. Um, what does my family say about me being away? Um, my kids don't like it that much. Um, they don't even think that I'm cool. I'm not allowed to um, bring them to school or anything or talk about what I do. If teachers ask them, oh, I read in the newspaper that your mom is doing this and this, they are embarrassed. So yeah, um, I don't think that's kind of anything cool for them. Um, yeah, but of course they are proud a little bit as well. And who's taking care of my kids when I'm away? Um, they're dead because they do have one and he's perfectly capable of looking after his kids, um, even if I'm not there to help him. Um, yeah, and um, of course my village includes parents and parents-in-law and a lot of great friends. Um, and that's the same that I said about the work. Um, I think that in your private life, you need networks and friends and uh, teamwork as well. So that's my take on the whole woman, women and STEM topic. So I stop sharing. I hope that you see the panel again. Yes. And I give back to you, Simone. Thanks a lot, Annika, for a very interesting uh, point of view from your experience, personal experience, that can be inspiration for many uh, women. Um, and next step will be uh, Claudia. So we have uh, here with us Claudia Kessler. Uh, Kessler. She's a visionary entrepreneur, aerospace engineer, trailblazer for commercial human space flight, influential speaker, ambassador of more women to space, and founder of the astronaut in uh, uh, company, I think say GmbH, and co-founder of Women in Air, Women in, uh, in Aerospace Europe. Uh, so she's going to present us the uh, the her experience with the astronauting project. So please, Claudia, the the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Ian, for having me, for hosting me on this afternoon. I'm going to talk about the Astronautin Project and uh, especially our training part in the Astronautin Project. Um, I hope you all heard of it that uh, hmm, it's already five years ago I started the initiative to bring the first German woman into space because there's never been a German woman in space. Um, Germany is the country with the most astronauts in Europe, um, but no German woman. And I thought I'm an aerospace engineer myself and my childhood dream, Onika, always was to be an astronaut since I'm still generation moon. So I was four year old when I saw the moon landing on TV. And since then for me, it was clear, I want to be an astronaut. But I never managed, I was always in the wrong age at the wrong time for the selections. So in the end, I was uh, yeah, very unhappy with the fact that um, when I asked the space agency, um, the, the director general and others in 2016, 2015 timeframe, why there is no German woman, they told me there is no woman in Germany who is capable of it. Because in the last astronaut selection in 2009, um, no woman, no German woman was selected. And that's the same as Annika said, of course, the selection criteria were made by men. The selection committee was pure male. And um, yeah, also some of the selection criteria clearly favored men in the selection. So I opened the job announcement. I was that at that time, the CEO of a space engineering company. And I opened the job announcement to recruit the first German woman. And we did a one year, recruiting process and we um, selected two astronauts and we already jump here right into the training um, today because after the selection we organized uh, and started to organize and we're still in the process of privately organized and financed astronaut training. We have a retired astronaut trainer from ESA in our team and we worked with a lot of cooperation partners to get the training together. And the most exciting part of it, of course, was the parabolic flights. We had two of them, one in Moscow in spring, in summer of 2017 in Star City, together with Space Affairs, who invited us to participate in that flight. And I got to go as well. So I loved it a lot, even though my stomach was not so happy about it. And then um, the second parabolic flight with Susanna and we selected two astronauts, Dr. Inza Thiele Eich and Dr. Susanna Randall. Susanna is an astrophysicist and Inza is a meteorologist. And Inza also has three kids and one of the kids was born during the training phase. So we even proved that you can train as an astronaut, be a mother and even be pregnant and get a, a third child in that period. It all works. It's not a, a, a no-go criteria. Yeah, that were the parabolic flights. The second one was in Bordeaux, together with DLR, with the German Aerospace Center in spring 2018. Um, the next, yeah, I guess you're all familiar with parabolic flights, so I don't need to explain to you how we simulate the 20 seconds of microgravity on the plane climbs up very steep, and then it flies this parabola curve, and in that time you're um, weightless and then it goes down again and of course also at that time um, it was a research mission um, in Bordeaux with Novis Bus and there was a group of women even involved which I was really happy about and it was around the 8th of March so World Women's Day so of course I took a picture with all the women that were involved on that day and uh, we posted that. And I talked to Novis Bus about once having an all-female parabolic flight, because again, that's never been done before. Um, and they even asked Knes about it, but Knes said there's no need for it. So we'll have to wait for things like that to come. Um, then we, um, in 2018, we got funding from DLR to get to the US and to visit the space places there. We were in Florida. Uh, we got to climb up the launch pad of the Boeing Starliner um, rocket, which unfortunately afterwards fell quite back in the development. At that time, we really had the impression that Boeing was much further in the development than the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon, um, which we also visited. We went to Houston um, to the control center and we went to California to visit SpaceX. Of course, both astronauts are doing fitness training regularly. Um, they have to stay fit 
they have to stay healthy. And um, we found one person who privately owns an aero trim. So we were allowed to train into that facility, which is a lot of fun, but also um, really uh, hard work for all your muscles because the whole body is in work at that time. And um, we did a diving training together with COMEX in Marseille in 2019. We got uh, sponsorships uh, from several organizations for that. And uh, they simulated an underwater moon mission with us. And we had the same issue as Annika has because our astronauts are really tiny. They like my size, 160, one meter 60, um, and not too, too big. They're strong, of course, and, and have a lot of endurance, but uh, they're not large. But the astronaut suit for the diving was, deep, again, um, developed for, for quite um, heavy and large male. So um, they had to improvise a bit. And um, you see Inca, uh, Inza here in the suit, um, the shoulders of the suit were like on her upper arms. And it was really, really hard for her to work underwater with the suit because it, it hurt. She had really big blue um, spots afterwards on both arms. Um, so that was another lesson. I have in the meantime um, tailored an astronaut suit that you see here in the background that we use for other purposes. Um, that is tailored to my size. So I, <laughs> for my analog activities, I have a, an astronaut suit that really fits me. Um, yeah, and we managed to cooperate with the German army, with the Bundeswehr and, and their division for pilot training, for fighter pilot training. And we went there last, uh, yeah, just during the, the COVID break last year in June, in June, 2020, and we were all allowed a bit uh, to go out. And they did the barrow chamber training there. They simulated the oxygen loss that you have during launch. And they also did the centrifuge. And um, SpaceX gave us their launch profile for the rocket so we could fly their launch profile in the centrifuge, which was really exciting for Inza and Susanna because they really got the feeling, okay, this is what I'm going to experience when I will be launched into space. And um, it helped them a lot to understand uh, how it will feel and what it will do with their bodies. And it was, again, it was uh, three very exhausting days for them um, because they had to go, yeah, through a lot of tests uh, body-wise and also through a lot of theoretical um, lessons. That's anyway, what we also did um, with this astronaut trainer in the team um, he organized uh, a university professor who gave uh, private lectures to the two astronauts so that they are yeah, basically trained everything that normal ESA astronauts also do for, uh, for their mission on uh, orbit mechanics, on satellites, on launchers, on space station, and so on. And they also had to do tests on that. And uh, they did their pilot license. Um, we also financed their pilot license. They finished that. Inza did her... Um, test for the pilot license, her certificate um, two weeks before giving birth. Um, she had a special allowance from the doctors to do that. And um, again, proved that you can do a lot more than men sometimes assume that women can do. Yeah, based on all that, um, I had founded two companies in 2017. Um, one is a nonprofit company, the Stiftung Erste Deutsche Astronautin, um, that organized all the training and will organize hopefully the mission one day because the two finance um, finished their basic training in December last year. Um, that was also confirmed by Axiom, um, whom we have an MOU with um, for a seat to fly to the space station. But we still need to convince the German government um, to finance this mission. As you probably know, it costs around $50 million. And um, we can, of course, not afford that privately. So we need a sponsor or a government to pay that flight. And we're still working on that. And we also founded the Astronautin GmbH, um, a space startup company that is now marketing everything that we learned during the astronaut training and during the whole time that we um, yeah, did things where everybody else told us that it's impossible what you do and you can't do it. And it's never been done like that before. And we heard that many, many, many times. And um, we always kept doing it anyway. And from that, we developed uh, 
an emp women's empowerment program, a leadership training for women, not only in the space sector, but we're using elements from the space sector and transfer them um, to normal life because our goal is not only to bring the first German woman into space, but to bring women to the top of society and economy to foster their careers, to strengthen them in their careers. And all the things that we learned, um, we have developed trainings. They, they are named like astronauting for a day or shine like a star or boost your career and so on. And we're working with professional trainers, but we are bringing in the space element. And um, we see that this is really um, an eye opener for the women that boosts them into a different perspective that lets them show to their life, to their careers from an orbit perspective and then also um, apply things that they learn in their daily life. And that's what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. And I mean, and it's simply fine. amazing. I had the, well, actually the luck to meet uh, Inza Susanna one day. Uh, yeah. They're really amazing uh, person and you just describe how much they, uh, they could achieve. And also thanks to your uh, determination in achieving your objectives. So thanks uh, again for all uh, for all the information and the and I hope uh, people who are joined today can uh, take inspiration and uh, contact you if you needed uh, to get more additional information on how to do something similar uh, in their own home country probably. Then with this we uh, complete our uh, panelist presentation. So we will uh, start the uh, Q&A session mine with uh, Claudia. Uh, we go in reverse order more or less. So the first question for you, and then we can see also from uh, Annika and uh, Letzke if they want to jump in. How do we actually uh, actively prioritize gender equality? I mean, you have seen that you, you are having uh, this project and uh, showing that uh, uh, everything can be done. Uh, and There is no limits for both sides. So then how do you think we can push more and uh, prioritize gender equality? Um, yeah, um, in the space sector, it's really hard because it's just so male driven. So every, um, yeah, you have to fight uh, centimeter by centimeter, I would say, because um, I mean, now if you, um, you just have to do things like that, we have to network, we have to stand together, we have to help grow each other and support each other as women and, and make them visible. I mean, that's what we also did with astronaut in, um, when we had the selection process, we had 400 fantastic candidates and we made them visible all the time. They were in the press, they were on TV, they were in the newspapers, um, they were on social media. And it's, uh, it's so important to make them visible and to show they are there and they can do it. And that's what you have to prove over and over again. And um, yeah, as Annika said, be a role model, be a mentor, um, give back, um, support other women, make them visible. And then we hopefully can implement the change at some point. Absolutely. And Annika, uh, you say that you, you were in your, your life was quite lucky because you didn't have to go through uh, some of these issues that women sometimes face. Uh, but do you see in the last few years, do you see anything that uh, from your side, I, I mean, you participate in many uh, other projects in order to uh, promote uh, the studies of uh, STEM uh, with young women. Uh, what do you think can be further done for this side for what you and uh, Claudia are already doing actually? Yeah, I totally agree with Claudia, everything that she said, because um, what I most um, encounter is um, when I talk to groups of kids and not only girls, but like school classes, everything. Um, it's not that they don't think that they can do it. Um, they just don't have the idea that it's possible to do it. Um, if you ask them what they want to be, or um, for example, if, if you ask them to imagine an astronaut or a scientist, um, they draw a picture of a white male wearing a lab coat or an astronaut, a male astronaut. Um, and if you don't see the people that are, are already there, the women that are already working in this area, um, then you don't even get the idea in your head that it would be a possible career choice for you. Um, so it can't be overrated to um, yeah, make the existing women visible and um, to help each other along. 
Um, and of course, there's always a debate about having quotas, for example. You can be of uh, different opinions about that. Um, probably it helps in the beginning as long as um, yeah, the favor is not um, equally divided or however to say that, yeah. Um, and then I think that, I mean, and since we are talking about astronaut training as a way to um, have gender parity, um, yeah, if you really are serious about having equity, then you should level the field and have equipment and hardware and tests that are um, suited for everybody and uh, that are not favoring men, I guess. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you very much. So uh, let's, uh, I think for, from your presentation, we realize actually Poland is doing a lot from that point of view. Do you think that this kind of project should be pushed also in all the other countries in order to uh, facilitate more gender equality? Well, giving uh, young women incentive to study STEM fields is one thing, but at the same time, we are having some heated discussion in our society regarding uh, women rights right now. So this is like very, uh, and it's very heated discussion. So I cannot say that it's all perfect here, uh, but uh, going further with that, uh, with this next ESA selection, prioritizing uh, women, uh, I can, I can, easily see that it, it will be probably to some point a political decision. If, for example, uh, if there will be a good candidate from Poland, maybe women or female will be prioritized there because there is some public uh, unrest uh, in, in, in this sector or in this field, um, part of our lives, just to give uh, what young women someone to look up to. And this is the other part of gender, uh, gender parity that uh, we could probably, we will probably witness in, in, in upcoming months. Um, but yes, this program that is still founded here uh, for young women, it's now we have 36% of women in STEM, uh, in STEM fields. What would be uh, maybe in 10 years we'll have 45%, who knows? I, I wonder what will, what will happen in like those next 11 years when we have both this kind of incentive for young women, but also those heroes that they can look up to uh, from different countries. And there will be more visit, uh, there, is, there will be a clear uh, um, focus on promoting uh, female astronauts or uh, uh, women in STEM fields. So I can, I'm like, a little bit hope, uh, like, mm, I'm hoping that the future will um, be like very good. That direction. Um, yes. Well, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, so we say that we, it's clear from what we are discuss, discussing is the way forward requires both policy uh, and let's say private action. Uh, and also to uh, highlight the, the nurturing of families, school and job environments that will allow girls and women to be comfort, uh, comfortable and confident to conquer the STEM field. So uh, according to you, Anika, what could be uh, done more to attract uh, more we uh, sorry to attract more women in STEM and space field. Um, well, I think that you should uh, or that we have to address several stages at once. Um, of course, it's important to start young um, and initiatives like uh, you said that I am working for Code for Space, for example, uh, which is an um, initiative where um, school or school teachers are taught to program, um, programming language that they can then later on use with their kids. Um, and that's, um, uh, yeah, one of the things that um, gives them an entry point into the STEM field um, by having fun uh, while learning something. Um, and yeah, I think that if you start at that young age, then um, you have a bigger chance to not lose so many girls because in the beginning they are all really interested in uh, having fun. Um, and once puberty hits, um, I don't know, some other things are getting more interesting, whatever. Um, yeah, but then at the same time, you have to um, support young women that are already starting their careers um, by, for example, having good childcare facilities. Um, by having um, financial support, um, stuff like that. And as uh, Lestek said, there are a lot of uh, different projects going on in all um, our countries supporting 
women, but I think they are not um, as known as they could be, for example. Um, and it could be done more in both of those fields as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's much more, but th those are two of the things that come to my mind and ask that question. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And Claudia, do you think there is a, I mean, you've been doing this for many years. So I guess from your side, you've, you know a lot what's going on and how can be improved. So do, do you have any any other idea that you couldn't put in place at the moment? So maybe you would find someone here that would be willing to support you in that. Yeah, I mean, what you all can do is um, we need role models. We need role models. Um, that's what works. There's been so many studies about that. Um, the kids need role models um, and they need role models that tell them, yes, you can do it. And they show them, yes, you can do it. Um, when I talk to my mentees now who all are engineers, but not in the space field, um, and I asked them if they would apply to the ESA's um, astronaut call, they all told me, no, why should I apply? I'm, I'm sure I'm not capable of that. So again, um, we're not reaching the women yet. We're not communicating it enough in a way that um, we can inspire them to to um, to want to grow, to want to uh, be even an astronaut. And I think um, there's still a long way we have to go. And um, yeah, shows like that are really important. Um, everything um, we, we're, the, the participants here are doing um, in the outside world is very important for that. And we just have to keep doing that and it will take a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a fact. that's less. As let's say it might take a few years as well to get the things rolling. And uh, let's like on this point, actually, you, you showed in your presentation that you had actually a quite good, almost 50% of participant and commander being women. Do you know, do you uh, usually uh, use this presentation in other events to promote and show that, uh, to attract more uh, participant and women to get involved in this kind of experiences? Unfortunately, not because I just done done this presentation this oh. <laughs> early. Um, this is the first time uh, the, the the grand um, premiere. Uh, but um, and like um, we are still like a small team, and we are learning how to advocate uh, and how to create the right um, partnerships. So that's why I know that we'll be doing something with Claudia or with Austrian Space Forum soon. Um, but uh, I, but like we were doing a lot of stuff uh, to make sure that we have this uh, uh, gender parity uh, during our missions. We are approaching women. We are, uh, and this is maybe uh, how we are uh, collecting all of our crews. M most of our analog astronauts are approached directly uh, by us, so that's maybe the reason. Uh, the last thing I would like to add to this um, incentive program with scholarships for young women. Um, 10 years ago, there was only 24% of women in, in Poland that were in STEM fields. Now it's 36. It is impressive change. So that's why I was wondering what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Well, uh, I hope that Poland will continue in this way and many other countries can take uh, inspiration and example from, from you. Uh, that's are quite impressive and thanks to your actually now that you prepare this presentation with the numbers you have statistics you can also present and show what you're actually doing actively so that would be a very good example also for other communities since the analog environment is getting bigger and bigger and there are more and more um, groups having their own uh, uh, setup and emission so it would be a very great example for the rest um, then let go for let's go for the last question um for the from the from the show and then we will open for the floor for uh from for, for the participant um the question is that what are the consequences of an underrepresentation and ab absence of women in shaping say in science and technology um Liza, you want to start on this now i feel underprepared um, <laughs> um well because th th that's uh, quite interesting since I can only answer in the uh, only way I can. I was thinking about that and I am unfortunately too young to, uh, to know what hardships uh, other women or women in general had and during their uh, uh, 
um, experiences and like my crew is really young and we were nicely shielded from, um, by our university and those nice incentives to that we believe that uh, the world is already uh, full of equality and and it's and, and it's part and the part gender parity is a reality now I am now we are learning that it's not and not only here in Poland but also outside so I'm not the best person to answer probably, <laughs> uh, probably Claudia or Annika could do but I mean you have direct experience you had you mem uh, you worked with with them in when you built the lunar so I was wondering if you notice uh, in other projects a difference being uh, working together with a women colleague or a man colleague oh. just but I mean don't worry <laughs> if okay you notice uh, anything otherwise um, but that was interesting to learn that uh, the, the crews, international crews were coming to Poland and they were very excited to have this gender parity and they were advocating it. So like Sergeant Pale created her uh, mission with uh, that in mind and she's a uh, vocal advocate for uh, gender parity. And I was, for me as a young, young person, it was already something to think about when, uh, when I thought that, oh, the, the better developed countries are uh, already after a certain level of acceptance to certain things and um, all and so some things that are in my presentation are obviously an afterthought after what I experienced from more experienced people uh, and some people that came to our mission were either um, very advocated about it and said that there is a definitely definitely a gap and a missed opportunity of women that are not participating enough in science and other female commanders were like already hard-headed researchers that uh, uh, mm, that were uh, inspiring but only by their um, example and that's also something to interesting to see those two kind of inspiring um, sides of uh, uh, female uh, engineers uh, researchers and analog astronauts you can you may say that now uh, analog studies and there are like dozens of crew calls in different habitats whether it's MDRS or high seas DMARS uh, it, or Lunaris uh, it's uh, it's great to see because there's plenty of opportunity to to uh, go and try yourself to get inspired to experience something new to come out of your shell this is something and it's a lot easier to do with uh, NGOs like the astronaut in Austrian Space Forum or uh, like private funded uh, companies like, my, like uh, myself, like mine, um, than to do it with all this machinery that the space agency need to deal with. And maybe this is how we crafted our own pocket dimension where uh, gender parity is already there. Who knows? Thanks a lot. Claudia, do you, what's your point on this? I mean, uh, it's a very, I think it's, I, it's a very difficult question in general, but uh, I mean, here we are free just to discuss and give our point of view and experiences. That's always good to share, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it will, um, science and technology will, will change a lot when more women are involved because they will bring in the female perspective and they um, will see things from a different angle and from a different point of view. I mean, um, you might have heard for, of the data gap that in many, many areas, we, things are yeah like spacesuits and other things, they are all designed for men. Um, but there are many areas for me, for example, I have very small hands. So an iPhone is not something that is convenient to hold for me. It's not designed for my hands. And there are so many things out there that are designed um, with a pure male perspective, not only in the space world, but in general in science and technology. And I think we need to get much more women involved um, to change that and to design things that are really um, yeah, fitting for both needs. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, definitely. And Annika, do you have anything you would like to add anything else? Yeah, I, I would like to add something along the same lines. I mean, we are doing science and um, also space flight, human space flight, um, to shape the future. And we want to build a future for everybody, not only for half of the population. So, of course, um, everybody should be involved in building it um, and add their point of view. Um, and without being too cliche, but everybody brings their own set of skills and um, women have some different skill sets than men um, in general 
Um, and I think that if you um, add everything to a group, that you have a richer group with more um, yeah, ability to adapt to new situations and everything, then if you um, narrow the field, so to say, um, so you um, miss something if you leave women out. Let's see if uh, Yara, Hien, did you collect some interesting questions in some yeah. from the chat? I'm not sure if you got it somewhere from LinkedIn. Martina or... asked, uh, this is addressed to Annika, you mentioned that you got selected because of your soft skills. Um, uh, she wonders which soft skills were those that got you selected. Well, we see soft skills very important. That's why we actually dedicated uh, the show to, uh, to, to soft skills. And, as a separate topic here. So very curious to hear. Um, well, uh, let's say the, the feedback after selection was kind of limited. So it's not like we got to sit down and got told uh, what actually made, um, why we made the cut, so to say. But um, yeah, um, I think that soft skills play a big role after the initial um, selection for um, scientific background and physical fitness and all the bigger things. And then you take a look at how people work in teams, if they can lead people, but also be led if they can swap or switch roles, depending on what is needed. Um, if you keep calm under pressure, if there's time uh, pressure or other stressful circumstances, that you stay calm and um, still focus and concentrate on your tasks. Um, yeah, that you're patient, but also creative, for example, that you can uh, find solutions. Um, communicative skills, of course, it's really important, of course, to work in a team. Yeah, I guess that's some of the most important things. Thank you, uh, Annika. Uh, Claudia, uh, can you give advice to those who want to follow the steps of uh, uh, the astronaut in, and, and and possibilities to set up similar projects in other countries. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the thing we were struggling most with is as um, with all non-government uh, organizations is of course the funding. So um, I think before you start something similar, you have to get some big companies behind you. We were lucky that at least in the beginning, Airbus was sponsoring us quite a lot and also DLR at some point a little bit but we were really struggling um, every year to survive. So um, we, I mean, I do have the concept and I'm very happy to share it because I think it's applicable to many other countries. And that was actually one of the idea that we had that especially smaller countries can, can do that and can in that way select their, um, their first female astronaut because it's a low cost approach. It's a, a, an approach that just needs a small team but it's still um, a very high level approach with a very high um, technical and scientific background. So I'm happy to share everything that we have. Um, we also have a, a concept paper about it or a, a summary, a thesis. I had a student um, summarizing the whole selection process from all sides. So I'm, I'm happy to share that. Um, send me an email and uh, we can go from there. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Um, thank you all. Uh, this was an amazing show. Unfortunately, we do not have more time for any more questions. So um, thank you for your precious participation. And uh, we uh, hope to see you next week for the success mentee mentor story that will co continue the role model part. So thank you uh, to our moderator and to our panelists. Uh, this was very insightful and all the best for the future ahead. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot to Space Connect. Enjoy.